So Amy, you and I go a long way in our journey through Microsoft, and you are a colleague, but also a very close partner at the senior leadership team of, of our company. And I've got a very deep respect for you and what you've done, what you keep doing for the company and beyond. I, I remember actually vividly many great, exciting one-on-ones we had in our professional life, but this conversation is going to be a bit different. It's going to be more personal, maybe emotional at mm-hmm. times as we discuss your own leadership and transformation journey and the way you think about your own purpose, your leadership philosophy, your impact at work and and beyond the professional circles as well. So it's a delight, Amy, to have you on my positive leadership podcast here in Redmond in Washington State. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm excited and honored that you asked me. So to start with Amy, I'd like to get back to your family roots. If you understand well, your childhood was in a small city in Kentucky and then in Nashville, Tennessee. (laughs) You and I have actually two things in common. We both grew up in the South. You in Kentucky in the US and me in Little France in Nice in the French Riviera. (laughs) And I think second thing we have in common, all dads were both doctors, but none of us decided to become doctors. (laughs) And none of us as well stayed in the South. So you didn't become a teacher either, despite I think having many professional teachers in your family. So can you tell us more how your parents, I think your grandma would play an important role as well, your sister and others significant have shaped some of your core values that you consider as your moral compass. And what are those early life values that in a way still define who you are and the way you think about life? I know it's a big question to start. It (laughs) is a big question to start. and we do have those things in common. Um, I did grow up in uh, Kentucky mm-hmm. um, in a relatively small town, um, a bit away from where my mother's side of the family yeah. uh, had grown up, uh, and which we were quite close to. Mm-hmm. Um, we, and I always had a very tight knit Hmm. family yeah. unit yes um, very close yeah. very close and in so many ways uh, I would say when I think about core values uh, leading by example hmm. uh, we weren't a family that maybe talked about the example you should set it was absolutely about the actions doing it that you took Showing it. <laughs> showing it every day. Every day. Whether that was showing how you cared for someone through actions, yeah. maybe it was showing that hard work, yeah. which is probably a second oh, yes. principle. <laughs> um, yes. That hard, valuable work. Yes. Done in the pursuit not of yourself or in recognition, mm. but in the enablement of others or of an others. outcome. It was never, and I think. Um, Probably that also emanates from from the sense of, you know, we grew up in the church in the hmm. yeah. in a, and so which is not I mean that's relatively common um, I think yeah. in many uh, smaller areas yes yes uh, the the church was the center of the community and the center hmm. of the value system in some ways yes. so hmm. the concept was never that you did it for for you for you you did it for a bigger purpose whatever yes. that purpose was to you yes. and yeah. in our sense that may have been. Uh, mostly about the community in which you resided, the family, friends, yes. the network, yeah. the town. Yeah. Um, and so I always knew that if you, uh, in our house, if, mm-hmm. if you wanted to be understood as having um, a good compass, a good understanding mm. of your role, you did that through hard work toward ends that benefited not you, but community. And yes. I think that shows itself in yes many of their choices. Uh-huh. Um, as you noted, my, my father's a doctor, yes. my sister's a doctor, yes. my mother was a nurse. <laughs> nurse, yeah. Um, my grandfather was a teacher. Hmm. Um, uh, my grandmother was active in the church, cousins, family members, all well, in that community, in community and involved. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's really transpired, I think, in your personality as well. It's interesting because, in a way, the words you've been using, Amy, are very uh, aligned with uh, some of the fundamentals of positive leadership, which is you go at one point from everything about yourself. I think we kind of all go through that cycle yes. at some point. <laughs> 
to be to the service of others. Uh, understand actually the way you, you can do that in your lives, mm -hmm. professional, personal, social together, is a big accomplishment. So I'm sure we'll get a chance to, to, talk, to, to, talk, about, to talk about that. Okay. So now really one of the core foundations again of a positive leader is self-awareness, self-confidence, so that you can actually allow yourself to be authentic, vulnerable and caring, big worlds, okay. challenging worlds, <laughs> challenging reality. But really it takes a lot of hard work on yourself, on oneself, to take care of you physically, mentally, emotionally, so that when you start your day, you feel a positive energy flowing into your veins and into your mind and then into your mouth, <laughs> and it flows. So what I'd like you maybe to share with our listeners is what are your daily routines, if you have any. Many of my guests have some routines <laughs> in the morning and in the night, mm -hmm. maybe as well, if mm -hmm. you can share. Where, you know, especially in the toughest days, whereas the CFO, one of the largest companies on the planet, you have to deal with some very, very big challenges. What do you say to yourself? <laughs> That's such a good question. I, I do have some routines. Mm. Um, and I think actually I've adopted them yes. in this job more so than maybe I realized before. Okay. It before. And, uh -huh. and I think to some reasons it's what the things you talked about. As yes. you become more aware of how you handle yeah. um, <clears throat> pressure and where that pressure comes from mm. and why does it exist, yep. um, I realized I needed better tools mm. um, to handle that. Um, Number one, sleep is incredibly valuable. Oh, yes. uh, people often, I think, even myself at times, used to think, oh, well, it's about the hours you, you work. Yes. Uh, I Now I'm a big advocate. It is the opposite. Exactly. It's about the sleep you get. Quality of sleep. It's about the quality of that rest, the yes. mind, the break yes. that your body needs. Uh, it's not about how many hours you put in, but it's about preparing yourself yes. to be really ready hmm. to have a meeting or a moment yes. in the work day or outside the work day yes. yeah. um, that's respectful. Hmm. Hmm. And it's a funny word to choose, but I think a lot more now yeah. that if I have a routine that values sleep, that values fresh air and exercise or mental breaks. I yes. tend to try to take a walk in the morning. Maybe if I need to be in the office, it's around lunch. Breezing as well, maybe. Yeah, just to take a little Deep breeze, meditation. Break. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a fan of the Headspace app, okay. but just because for yeah. me it creates some structure. Yes. Uh, we use it as a family in okay. the evenings. Oh. So you do family sessions. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> um, and I think in some ways it's just a time yeah. to be together, but also yes. to teach habits. Yes. Um, that we think are important. Um, so there's some routine, but yeah. I think if I were to share maybe why I think that investment yes. creates the energy that mm -hmm. you and I yep. want to see in a meeting, because we've seen the opposite, right? Yeah. I think when you get into leadership seats, mm. and it doesn't have to be the seats you and I are in, but yes. in any yeah. position, yes. you can often forget what the purpose of a meeting or a moment is. Yeah. <laughs> and it can seem like for you and I, it, it could be getting an answer. Mm -hmm. Usually that's not the purpose of a meeting anymore. No. It's about what example does that moment give to the people who mm. see you or I once a year? Yeah, yeah. Once every 90 days? Yeah. Once in a career? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> and that moment and what it means. Yes. What would to, you do? take them, away from that as well? What is the, yes. What, yeah. what happens in those yeah. 55 minutes, yeah. 25 minutes? The interaction, whatever. yes. And what do they leave with? Yeah. And so when I think about why do you create routines? Mm. Why do you create space in your day yeah. to be ready? It's because to me, it's another day. Mm-hmm. To a lot of people, it's their moment. It's their day. It's their, their day. day. Their big day. Their their yeah, capital yeah. D day, as opposed to you yes. and I. Yeah. Where it's Tuesday. Yes. <laughs> or Wednesday. <laughs> so you're very sensitive to that people uh, situation awareness and, and and context for the people surrounding yourself. Because other, if you miss those, yes. You miss everything, really. Agree with you about what it means to really do a 
job yes um, as opposed to c- complete the task, <laughs> yes. right? So, so building on that, Amy, what is actually a good day for you? <laughs> and what does it mean for you as a leader to have a good day? <laughs> oh, I, I'd say that a lot, is that yeah. I think you have to put yourself in that place. Ah. Um, and it is a choice. Hmm. It doesn't happen by accident. It cannot happen <laughs> by accident, and you and I both know oh, yeah. that. It's that... Um, yeah. A good day is a way I tell myself that if I don't reset, Hmm. there are things going on in everybody's life that are the opposite on occasion of good. Yes. Their pressure, their sadness, there's things that take energy. Yes. And I try to then tell myself, I need to make today good. And so... Hmm. You have to decide to do that. And for me, I tend to do it on my either drive in or if I'm staying and working from my home office, I tend to do it on a walk and say, okay, now is the time. So you prepare your mind. Prepare prepare. the mind to (laughs) say, here is my day. Here are the moments that I need to accomplish. Hmm. And it needs to be good. It doesn't mean everything that's going to happen that day is yeah, good or positive yes, yeah. or easy. It means you're making a choice about how you respond. Yes. <laughs> and if you start there, yeah, it, it's far, m- I think, more empowering. It is. Um, to make to make better decisions. And I think I'm sure we'll get back to that, Amy. It. It really uh, creates uh, a wonderful environment for others to speak up, to open up, to thrive, <laughs> because you make it yep. much easier for everyone else as well, which I think we all realize al- across, I mean, along the time in our careers. So um, one thing that's really interesting about your career is that your past leadership is not a linear one. I mean, as we <laughs> discussed earlier, you came from a family that valued education, uh, servicing the others as a doctor. Your mom taught in nursing school as well. And in fact, I think I heard you mention that pretty much of your mom's family, again, were in the education sector. But pretty quickly at college, you decided not to become, as I said, a doctor, didn't go into teaching, but ended in finance. <laughs> so, so. How did that work? I mean, most CFOs have a background in accounting financial law. You don't. You got a bachelor, I think, in economics. I mean, very great background from Duke, then MBA from Harvard, and then started Goldman Sachs in 2002. And there's this great cut, which I found where you say that you continually took jobs where you, where you are not really qualified for. So how important has it been for you to move outside of your areas of comfort, <laughs> outside <laughs> beyond the plan of record you yes. had, to accept, to take risk and accelerate your personal growth? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I think, jean you we talked earlier and you mentioned there are lots of things that are critical hmm. to being comfortable taking risk, but the yes. probably the one that's the most critical is self-awareness and self-confidence those sure. two aspects. Yes. And so I think earlier in my career, mm-hmm. I was not nearly as comfortable. And it's because, you know, I, I took a job at Goldman Sachs, it's true. Yep. I had taken zero finance classes at that time, zero accounting, although I still haven't <laughs> taken those, as you know. <laughs> and really, I was just looking yeah. for a job, hmm. not a career. A job. A job. Hmm. And everybody else seemed to be getting jobs, and I, feel I, I needed one, and other people had chosen banking. Uh, at that point in time, a lot of people chose consulting yes. jobs or banking jobs, and I didn't want to travel uh, hmm. as much. Hmm. And so... Well, at least you went to New York, right? E- oh, yes. <laughs> at least made it that far. And that seemed very far at yeah, the time. Yeah, I guess from uh, South, right? Yes, we were not a traveling <laughs> yeah. uh, family, family yeah. for lots of, lots of hmm. reasons. Um, and so, hmm. you know, you take a job because you don't have a better idea in that moment. Yeah. And then you learn, hmm. which I've always said to people, hmm. you know, I learned parts of it I liked, parts of it I didn't, I didn't enjoy yeah. as much. Yeah. Um, through that, I mm-hmm. learned a little bit more about what maybe my own talents were. Yeah. But was never terribly confident hmm. in them. Yes. Um, 
you get validation through yeah. that work. Mm -hmm. You build a little confidence. Yeah. But then it took me maybe longer than others to realize that I maybe wasn't made for that work. Hmm. Um, well, although I liked many things. I worked there yeah. in, for a long time. For a long time, many years, yeah, right? I, yeah, yeah. 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 So it wasn't, I always say to people, <laughs> You know, they're disappointed when maybe their first job choice doesn't work. And yeah. I'm like, oh, I, I've been through many yeah, uh, yeah. that I, I maybe <laughs> wasn't deemed as successful. Yes. But in those moments, yeah. you have to find that yeah. awareness. And as I maybe got into my early 30s, hmm. um, which I remind people, I had no job at that point. I had quit no my job. Mm -hmm. I had no job. And no plans. Uh, no plans <laughs> at 30. On your own. On my own. Yeah. And was sort of lo lost, hmm. right? Like is, yeah. should I go into academics? Should I pursue a different, hmm. completely Pass. different discipline? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, mm -hmm. No, plan. no plan. And I simply had a friend here who said, let's just find some grounding. Like, hmm. let's get another job and just work on it. Yeah. And I realized in that moment, I think I'd solve for everybody else but my own hmm. sort of confidence yes. and yeah. and finding yeah. that grounding and so maybe at 30 when I take mm. a job at Microsoft yeah <laughs> um, I found that grounding huh it uh, was an accident it was a bit it was it? of an accident <laughs> yeah or something else at work um, <laughs> and I say to people all the time um, one of the best accidents that could have happened that could have happened yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's great, great to hear the way you've been thinking about actually experiencing work, Amy, and the way you, you didn't necessarily have a vocation as you started, <laughs> but you grounded yourself, getting to know yourself in reality, and then deciding to, to find the right place to go and, and grow your potential. It makes me think, actually, of a conversation I had with someone, um, uh, with Ermina, Erminia Ibarra. She's a professor of organizational change at London Business School. And what she's, this is what she told me on a podcast. Don't let the way you've done things in the past define you, and don't be afraid to make radical change. And she talks about the cycle of acting like a leader and then thinking like a leader. Uh, of a change from the outside in, which creates what she calls outsides. So what she means is the principle holds that the only way to think like a leader is to first act, mm. take action. And I think you are someone who takes action. Yeah. <laughs> I, can I can confirm that to my listeners in a big way. So uh, you got a lot of incredible experiences, of course, along your career at Microsoft and, and the way, in ways that could help you changing and shaping your perspective as well, I guess, on the world and the economy, on the business and many things else. So uh, you've been living, you've been here of that. And so one of the key, you know, attributes really that, that we find as we expose ourselves to new experiences is the way we are able, again, to build that positive energy in ourselves and to create an environment again for our team to do our best work. So can you tell us the way you can help people in your team to particularly in some of the most challenging times and we are, you know, like any large company, we've gone through ups and downs through financial crisis, 2008 and no, well, maybe a recession coming up, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and so how have you built uh, your people faith in themselves? How do you do that? Oh, it's a, this is a hard one because I think it's also grounded in some consistency. Yeah. Right. Um, people always ask, because I think they may think my job is different hmm. than it is. I tell people I do three things hmm. as the CFO of Microsoft. I pick leaders. Yeah, number one. I develop leaders. Mm -hmm. And I allocate resources. Hmm. There are lots of other things at some level, earnings calls, yeah. but <laughs> but, those, but that's not really yeah. the what job. The job, yes, you're right. Yeah. The job, there's three things I said. Yeah. Two of them yeah. are about building people. People and teams. And teams. Yes. Because at the scale that you or I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have are asked to run yep. organizations, when you start to confuse the real job, yes, uh, 
it can be a real challenge because if you think of the job as picking leaders mm. and developing leaders, and then the last resourcing, you remind yourself mm. of the things you can uniquely do. Yes. As opposed to all the things that can be done in can the be seat. done, the long task. So back to your talents and unique skills and passion as well, I guess. It comes back to those yeah. things, yeah. right? Because then you say, okay, every action, every meeting, yeah. tying it back, yes. every moment that you may have a group organization come together remotely or together, yeah. mm -hmm. every time you're in a big group, mm -hmm. you get to decide how you're gonna do those three things. And so for me, building those teams means creating clarity hmm. so that they yeah. and the leaders know it's their responsibility. Realizing that power doesn't come from being the decider. Yeah. Real power comes from building an organization that can make decisions and when it's build. Old and yes. <laughs> and so when you start to move the ego and the id oh, yeah. <laughs> from the thing, from the job, hmm. you start to spend a lot more time on others and teams and leaders. Yes. And a lot less time making sure you're the person. Hmm. And I think that journey is the journey of what that you're talking about. You have to say, yes. okay, well, I'm going to spend my time building confidence. I'm going to spend my time building confidence in others. I'm going to spend my time hmm. coaching before the meeting so yes. that I'm not in the meeting. Yeah. And you think about every choice. Who's going to respond to the email? Yeah. Where should the email go? It's in yeah. every action. Every small detail every matters. Small every small detail. It I, I, yeah. I, I love the way you, you talked about those kind of three Uber priorities in a way in your life, professional life, at least Microsoft. I mean, be good mm -hmm. then maybe to discuss beyond that professional life. Yeah. And the way you use that as, as your compass to really understand what is expected from you to achieve in right. that particular moment, instant, with that interaction with customers, with people, with teams, with analysts, mm -hmm. and back to those fundamentals. So I think that brings so much clarity for a leader and not be confused and attached to position of supposedly strengths yeah. or superiority, yes. which is, you know, which is ir irrelevant. It's irrelevant. <laughs> and I think this is the one thing that's so hard, I think, when, yeah. we, when you or I talk about it, is a lot of people see the position in a hierarchy. Completely, yeah. <laughs> and think with that comes things. Yes. What really comes with it? Hmm is a decision to make service, like in service, <laughs> part of your daily existence, not about yep. the meeting. And yes. That pivot, Yeah. which I didn't do until later. Same with me. Right, you don't, <laughs> You don't realize moments. that, you don't realize the beginning. No. So I'd li like to expand a discussion on the way you do that at scale, building, picking those talents, mm -hmm. building those organization capabilities people. You and I have been together actually sponsoring the Microsoft Management Model, the famously famous model called Model Coach Care. We've been even registering together a learning session on LinkedIn, which I invite our listeners to check out. <laughs> and you've been teaching, by the way, just to tease you, uh, maybe one day you could be a teacher, right? Can't you? <laughs> you maybe. You've got some, uh, <laughs> some kind of DNAs, I, I guess, from, from the family, and you, you, you alluded, alluded to that, actually. Mm. So anyway, back to caring. You know, in that session, you uh, was listening it again, and you were uh, basically emphasizing three key practices to attract and retain the best talents. Number one, be intentional and, and enthusiastic about the potential for individuals to thrive and create an environment where people can actually thrive. Number two, know everyone's capabilities and aspirations, like one by one. <laughs> Number three, invest in the growth of others by guiding them in navigating and growing their career. So can you share with us the way you learned and you've been practicing that caring muscle along the way? <laughs> and any kind of, not more than tips, any kind of advice, coaching advice you have for our listeners, particularly again in that moment, uh, Amy. And of course, yes. we've gone through the pandemic. You know, here comes another time and who knows where it's going to go, depending where you live in the world as well. So. How much caring 
helps to <laughs> be I in think, a better place. I yeah. think this is an interesting. People interpret caring yeah. in many ways. Oh, yes. And I have taken caring, and lots of the language that you and I just used, is about an investment you make hmm. in someone else to yeah. understand their goals. It's about them. It's about them. It, the care hmm. is really taking the time. Oh, yeah. It's taking the time and the commitment to understand really what they want, really respecting those choices. Yeah. Um, you know, I think at some point you go through this naive journey as a leader around thinking everybody wants to be on the same journey you're on. Yes. Hmm. Because it's been a really great journey. I. I yeah. love my journey. Yes. But it's mine. Completely. And it's my choices, mm -hmm. it's my trades that I've made against other pr priorities people yeah. have. Um, and so caring for me is about that investment to understand that the journey is theirs. Mm -hmm. And they may value different things, <laughs> likely do. Different challenges, different in, their challenges lives as well. in their life, different, different aspirations things, as well. Yep, yep. Different moments that matter. Yep. And if you do the three things you outlined, yeah. it means reserving judgment. Yes. And this is the hard one. The jump immediately on your judgment. Yeah. My judgment yes. of their choice. Yes. There is no, that's not part of it. Yeah. <laughs> the part of it is only, <laughs> Yes. I want to understand the journey that yeah. you want to be on, and I want to think about how I can support yeah. that journey, journey yes. even if it may not match, hmm. in my mind, yeah. the journey you are, like, wow, if I had your attributes, I would really want to do this. Yeah. I may get excited by that, yeah. <laughs> but that's not the that's job. Not, that's not that's the job. Not the yeah. job. Yeah. And I do think that's in those moments. If I could offer, you know, advice. Yeah. It's um, the investment of time mm -hmm. and the reservation of judgment, mm. and then the energy needs to go toward the other. The others. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Love it is is very complementary, obviously, to. The other muscle I've been passionate about, which I know you're passionate about as well, Amy, which is, of course, coaching people. Yes. Which, you know, in my favorite, one of my favorite episodes I had with Michael Bungestani, it reminds me, of course, of a few other principles he's been using. I've tried to practice myself for years. Be curious. <laughs> Be lazy in a sense of not finding the solution for the others, <laughs> fixing the problems for the others, which I've been guilty of doing for mm -hmm. so many years in my life. And be often in a way you open for that moment of coaching with people. Yeah. So I'd like to expand the discussion on something additionally critical to build lasting capability you as a team who's going to really bring its very best with you every single day in any organization, not just in a business, could be an NGO, could be public services. It's a sense of belonging. And I think it's something core to your heart as well. So could you unpack with me what is the sense of belonging so important? How do you build it? How do you build it? Oh, this is, I think this may be the thing I care the most about in mm -hmm. building a team. Um, or building any group. Hmm. You know, whether it's in my personal life yep. or uh, in my professional life, which on occasion can blend themselves. For sure. When, yeah, when we've been yes. in a place <laughs> for so long. Yep. <laughs> belonging. Hmm is a sense to me of a of comfort and support hmm. it's a feeling that you create in an environment yeah that has a person hmm. focus not on putting their energy toward wait how can i feel like hmm. i have all the information i need how can i feel like i can ask for help how can yep you take that away because the inclination is always to ask for help. For sure. The inclination is always <laughs> to, a to ask, mm -hmm. to feel like if you've made a mistake, you should raise your hand yeah. because there'll be aid offered. 
people are going to jump to help you. Yes. And if you feel be- a sense of that, yeah, I think you then create bravery. Yes. Yes. It lets bravery. people do yes. great things. Yeah. yeah. It lets them offer maybe unusual suggestions mm-hmm. to a problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, things that seem maybe unrelated, but yet when they say them, become completely related. Yeah. And I look back and I think when I have felt like an yeah. outsider, mm. I never did any of those things. <laughs> I never raised my hand. Yeah. yeah. I never whispered to the person next to me, maybe there's a better way. Yes. Yeah. I never sent an email asking for <laughs> clarify. I never did those things. Yeah. When I felt a little on the outside. Yes. And then you think about, wow, if I felt on the outside. What about the others? <laughs> imagine yeah. Yeah. how the vast majority of people who sure. do not have the background and privilege that you and I have For sure. must feel in those moments. Yeah. So then it becomes almost an imperative, like a weight. Yes. <laughs> that if you are not doing that as a leader, if you're not creating enabling people to only do what they're capable which is amazing things it is amazing to get that down yes. then you have to take that away yes. and so yeah. that's why belonging for me is a hmm. almost purpose <laughs> yes because if you just for one second think hmm. what don't you do hmm. when you what like what what behaviors hmm. And you know that they're all the things that don't make people shine. For sure. And so we know what people shining looks like, yeah. right? You know, yeah. Yeah. the joy, the yeah. the pride, yeah. Yeah. the way yeah. they yeah. walk home. Yeah, yeah. The way they go home and yes. say pe- to people, I had a great day. And I'm proud of the, the day I had. And, and the they're proud. And then yes. that builds in your personal life. Oh, for sure. Right. And so I, when I envision that cycle, hmm. then those days you remember... Oh, yeah. Did you build that? Did you think about it? And we use lots of words for it, as you know, know here, I, I, inclusion. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But belonging. It's a great world. I think it's a nice word. It's a great world. It also, honestly, reminds us of uh, the belonging to our families as well. It does. Family roots as well. So in a way, it brings people back to their to their core, I think. So it's wonderful uh, way, I think, described that. The criticality of that sense of belonging, Amy. So moving almost to the end, almost. Uh, I was talking actually to Pete Carroll, that I think you know well mm-hmm. as well, the Seattle Seahawks head coach on the podcast. He's someone, as you know, who's been spending a lot of time and energy on making sure his players feel like they belong. He used that word too. <laughs> and he realized that it's only when people feel like they belong that they are willing and able to hear what they need to improve actually as well. That to push yourself to your limits, to take risks, to be prepared to fail at the highest levels. And you need to feel uncomfortable from time to time. So being mindful about finding ways to making your team feel relaxed, whether it's looking them into the eyes and smiling more or coming out behind your desk, these things matter. And so coming back to your reality as well, Amy, uh, as a CFO again, you present Microsoft uh, to the financial markets for all times a year. <laughs> you do the Microsoft earnings call, presenting financial results uh, to investors and the media, and, uh, and those webcasts, as we call them. They're huge events with mm-hmm. a lot of uh, intensity and questions and some answers you provide as well. <laughs> And even if those things are going incredibly well and you've got an incredible track record of representing uh, incredibly well the company, they must be very stressful events. So how do you manage those situations? <laughs> I know before, early you on, know, you talked about your routines. I do. Is it what helps you? And what else do you do despite all the noise that happens in your background to be ready for that moment. <laughs> oh, it's such a good question. And I will make a few comments about it because I do think it's it can be helpful beyond um, maybe the narrow audience yes. of people who do c- CFO earnings calls. Yeah. Yeah. I um, still get very nervous. Hmm. I, you know, get anxious about the moment. Yes. And to make sure I'm centered Hmm. in that. Um, I have a few things I do. I, uh, number one, I 
<laughs> people laugh. I eat lunch very early. <laughs> Earlier than Earlier than usually. Yes. Than usual, and I'm already eat a little early because so I'm a morning person. So early is that? Uh, like 10 o'clock in the morning. So I just have a okay. Wow. I, so yes. because for me yeah. at that point, yeah, I then don't do other things. I got you. So at that point. I've decided your entire body. My entire body needs to become more grounded. Yes. You need to clear your mind. Yes. I do not answer email. I do not answer text. My phone is Should down. Your phone, et my phone is yes. away. Yeah. 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 Um I take a walk. Uh-huh. Um you will recall I used to have to do one earnings call a year from yes. a remote location at our oh sales yeah. event. Oh, yes. And so taking walks in cities <laughs> I wasn't comfortable with, I think I made some of your sales team nervous because I looked no. like I was wandering um, the <laughs> hallways of, of, of hotels around the world. But yeah. <laughs> it was more just keeping the consistency for me. Yeah. Um, then I do some breathing exercises. Um, and then... Um, I just read through the script one <laughs> last time. Yep. And then I'm done. And you're done. And then I'm done. And after I've been doing them for a little over nine years now, yeah, so yeah. for a year, so after 30 something, <laughs> um, the routine is still the same. Still the same. And it works. And it works. And I think what it does is remind me mm. in those moments, I tell myself, yeah. it's about the real job. Yeah. Yeah which is to explain to the best of my ability, mm -hmm. internally and externally, mm -hmm. the decisions we're making and to provide that clarity mm -hmm. to the people who have bet on us. Mm -hmm. And that's investors, that's employees, that's customers, that's partners. All those stakeholders. It's yeah. all of yeah. it. And yeah. you then say, yeah. I'm gonna do my best transparency my best authentic integrity. authentic integrity are the things you care about yes not the mm. the perceived judgment that yes. comes of yes. a stock goes up or yes. down yeah, yeah. because that's that's a moment yeah <laughs> the things you're really about are the durable things yes. integrity yes. trust yeah clarity yeah so i focus on those and of course then people say after so many calls Yep. Is it easy? Does it not take work anymore? Hmm. And the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> still we still work. do all of those things, <laughs> right? We still practice. We still work. But some we prep. Still, and we yes, still do yes. lots of it. And yes, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm thankful to the people who get me ready. Yeah, people may think sure. that you're. Uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's a good reminder. The coach is not always the one yeah. driving the team. Um, <laughs> the team actually is pretty capable. So those are. But it does look more like that. And I think about that for every meeting. If yes. you. Think about a hard conversation or an easy one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should prep for it. Yep. Yeah. You should be clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you should have integrity in it. Yeah. And I think those lessons, right, then give you the confidence yeah. to do the right thing. And it can be applied to many other Almost every moments, hard moment. Moments in your life. Personal life, yes. Yes. professional life, a coaching moment yeah. with a teammate. It, it's... If you if you remember the why, yeah. as opposed to maybe the emotional yep. stress of the moment, yep. I just think you go back to doing the right thing. Yeah, it's a it, and I think that can sometimes be hard, but fantastic, fantastic coaching. And no, unfortunately, comes the very last question because <laughs> you've got to prepare as well for the next. Running <laughs> <laughs> school, Amy. Yeah, uh, want to finish with a discussion about basically the role of business in the world and business community and business you know uh, in corporate world i just recorded a fantastic discussion with sir ronald cohen don't know if you know him he's he's someone who created apex partners so the time where he was actually one of the very first vcs in the world he created as well the first social impact bond in the world and advised the uk government and the g8 on their social innovation agenda Ronnie, as he likes to be called, believed that our existing social contract has expired and we are now in the process of drawing up a new one in the form of impact capitalism. He's deeply convinced that the combined power of financial markets, entrepreneurs, and big businesses to bring urgently needed solutions is vastly greater than even the power of governments. 
and that we must harness this power. So he believes indeed that it's time to reshape capitalism so that it delivers its promise to increase prosperity and social progress for all, spreading meaningful economic opportunity to billions of people, lessening inequality and preserving our planet for future generations. I know this is a big and bold vision, Amy. <laughs> uh, I know it's, it could seem almost naive at some point, but how do you see the role of the business community beyond, of course, delivering the expected financials for the shareholders, number one? Has the time come indeed to not only do that, but also be an active participant in helping the world and the planet to be a better place for you kids, my kids, and all of us? Well, I think this is one where, you know, you and I have spent a lot of time, even at Microsoft, yes, about how we can participate in that. It's we're lucky in many ways because Very we much. work at a place, yes, whose mission is in fact to empower those things to happen, yeah. not just for ourselves mm. inside our walls, but to empower customers and partners to do the same many of whom share a vision yes. that the role um, of corporations is to have profitable solutions mm -hmm. to the problems of the planet, yeah. I think is what Satya and I and you are often Love using di this. discuss. Yeah. And whether that is mm -hmm. investments in sustainability, yeah trying to find innovative solutions yep. using our capital and along with those of, and technology. Yep. Talents, et cetera, yeah. To help a breakthrough. Hmm. Because I do think there's both business opportunity, which is really yep. what the conversation. Completely. There, it's not philanthropy. I'm talking about philanthropy. Talking there is about a real, yeah. There's real opportunity. Yeah. Yes that will be created by technical advancement mm -hmm. to have durable solutions yeah. in climate but in other places. Yeah. And the role that we can have mm. in seats like yours or mine mm -hmm. is to see the world as a connected place, mm. right? Yeah. Where investments we make in, in wind or carbon removal. Yeah, yeah are of course good for us. I don't want to mislead sure. anyone. They're sure. absolutely good for the Microsoft Corporation yes. because we believe that hmm? um, our commitment to net zero is a real commitment Yes. to deliver on. And we're executing against that commitment. And yes. we are execute against yeah. that commitment. Yeah. But it's also that hmm. those solutions by companies hmm. who have the ability to make those kind of commitments um, yes. and the flexibility to do it yeah. can lead. And in fact, mm. we feel we should lead in those ways. Yes. Um, it matters to our employees. Mm. I think it does matter to our shareholders. I think it does, increasingly. I think, <laughs> I think it matters <laughs> yes. to our customers, to yeah. our partners. And so it's not that we do it for credit. Mm. You do it because it is actually mm -hmm. a profitable solution. Yes. In search of a profitable solution yes. to the problems of the planet. Yeah. And those problems are numerous. And I think we, our job is to pick the ones where we can have the biggest impact. Mm -hmm. um, we've picked uh, sustainability. We've picked affordable housing yeah. in, in places and in around the world. We've picked uh, inequality. Yeah. Um, maybe as our largest commitments that we see yep. where we can make a real difference. Yes. Uh, there are others, yeah. broadband access. We can yep. go down the list of things that can help shrink gaps. Yep. Um, and also, who can build the next generation of employees For sure. with real skills. Yep. They're valued in the market today. Build an economic opportunity that builds on itself. And it so builds. I think yeah. those are the days that help mm -hmm. make days good. Yeah. Right? When back you say how you get day. back to having a good day, <laughs> yeah. is you remember yeah. those aren't side pursuits, they're fundamental mm. pursuits. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to think about hiring the best employees around the world, if you want to think about retaining the best people, if you yeah. want to think about building connection and inclusion yeah. and belonging, yes. 
these things do that. Yeah. They do that. Yeah, they do. And they build purpose. Yes. And that purpose encourages others. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I do think those things matter. They People matter. often ask, can I, can I do a math equation on it? <laughs> And I've thought more and more maybe I can, Yeah. right? Because you know what employee retention means. For you know sure. what the best people mean. You know the value of that. You yes. know what yes. um, getting a profitable solution yeah. to sustainability means. Yeah. And I have increasingly believe that if we need to be <laughs> do the math, we can do the math. Yeah. Okay. What a wonderful way to and that conversation with actually Amy. It's been, a, it's been a real, real pleasure to get to know you a bit better, the different one-on-one -on -one that we had in the past, from Kentucky to New York to Redmond, Washington State, and more importantly, to your leadership journey. I think it's a wonderful uh, and inspiring example for many of listeners, particularly young female talents across the world, to feel inspired about the power they have in themselves to achieve more to achieve more and to have the bravery we, you talk about, to have the ability to create the space for themselves, to speak up, to grow, and to basically, you know, carry that positive energy with others in their lives. So thank you so much for that moment, Amy. And I wish you, of course, the very best, not just for the next earnings call, <laughs> but for all the big things you're going to do, not just for Microsoft, but beyond Microsoft and your community. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. 